I'm Jill Pellew, um, Senior Research Fellow of the Institute of Historical Research, which is very kindly hosting our event this evening, and I just want to really welcome you all. It's fantastic to have so many participants in our event, and we're really looking forward to it. I'd like to welcome, initially, our first speaker, who is Miss Emily Drew from our wonderful and extremely efficient publishers. Bloomsbury Academic. Um, Emily is editorial director and we've been working with her for ages and it's wonderful to actually see her face tonight. Um, she is director of history, philosophy, education and linguistics for Bloomsbury Academic. Emily, I'm going to just hand over right to you to kick the thing off. Good afternoon, everyone, and many thanks, Jill, for the introduction. I realise my um, list of subjects is a bit of a mouthful to, to um, the list. Um, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak briefly about Utopian Universities. Miles first pitched the book to me in the autumn of 2018, and I was immediately interested in the idea of a volume that promised to tell the history of these new universities of the 1960s. And I'm very proud of the book that we are launching today. I think there were two particular aspects that I wanted to pull out that as a publisher made the experience of working on this book unique. The first is clearly the, clearly the extraordinarily broad and impressive range of contributors to this volume, including writers from a non-institutional as well as institutional background. It is a credit to the editors of this volume that they've been able to bring together a range of voices and, and achieve such a clear and coherent book. I think the second aspect that makes Utopian Universities unique from a publisher's perspective is the breadth of context it provides. Although the 1960s movement was itself global, actually being able to provide that coverage in a book is no easy task. And it's something that we constantly, as publishers, try to achieve. This book really has the potential to appeal to readers from a range of different disciplines and backgrounds. And it's really, when you read it, it's truly accessible, so you can, anyone can pick it up. And I think that is itself a real selling point. There are many more aspects of the book that we'll go on to hear about in the course of this afternoon, in the evening. But I want to particularly thank Jill and Miles for all their hard work in bringing the book together and the contributors for their own fantastic contributions. This year, more than any other, has made us rethink all sorts of concepts including what it's like to be at university and how best to launch a book. And this book provides insights and foundations from which we can all learn. So I have the honor now of introducing the chair of the panel, Professor Sir Rick Trainer, Re Rector of Exeter College, Oxford. Thank you very much, uh, Emily. It's a particular pleasure for me to participate in this session uh, as chair of the panel, as you say, and I'm also doubling up as a panelist myself, I had the pleasure of chairing the advisory council of the Institute of Historical Research for a few years when I was principal of King's College London. And indeed, the reason, contrary to current fashions and webinars, that I'm wearing a tie today is that um, uh, Miles, who was director of the IHR for part of that time, told me at the end that I'd worn a yellow tie every time for every meeting of the advisory council, so I didn't want to let him down. But um, more substantively, um, universities have loomed large in my own research on British elites, partly in a co-authored history of Glasgow University where I worked for 21 years and currently on some work I'm doing on reform in Victorian Oxford. But much more importantly, um, I'm really glad to be playing a role in launching um, Utopian Universities, a global history of the new campuses of the 1960s. Because uh, as Emily is implying, I think, this is a book on an important subject, which so far hasn't attracted a great deal of attention, though admittedly some real attention from historians. And I think it's manifestly a rich collection of essays in which the contributors have um, conducted systematic research, including in a wide array of primary sources as reflected in their footnotes. And thanks to the wisdom of the publisher and the editors, 
and the willingness of the contributors, we've got a set of essays which pays a lot of attention inevitably to the UK, but which also has a lot of international and comparative material. My main task in, in this part of the session is to outline the format that we're going to follow. So after these introductory sort of scene setting comments of mine, each of the panelists, including myself, will give a five minute commentary on what has struck us about the volume with some special reference to particular chapters that uh, Jill and Miles have assigned to each of us. I'd like now to introduce my fellow panelists. Um, after I've given my commentary, the first speaker will be Professor Sir Chris Husbands. Chris is Vice Chancellor of Sheffield Hallam University and was formerly Director of the Institute of Education and is himself a scholar of educational policy and institutions. Chris will be followed by Professor Heike Jöns, who's Professor of Human Geography at the University of Loughborough. Heike is a historical geographer who has published on the history of both British and German universities. And Heike will be followed by the final panelist, Dr. Joanna Newman, who is Secretary General of the Association of Commonwealth Universities. Formerly, Joanna and I were colleagues at King's where she was Vice Principal International. She's herself a published historian, especially on the British Empire, including her book published last year on the British West Indies and the flight from Nazism. And she's also written on higher education. Once we four panelists have had our say, the two co-editors of the volume Jill and Miles will have a chance to present their own perspectives. So first of all, uh, Jill, who as uh, she's pointed out as a senior research fellow at the Institute of Historical Research and is a historian of the civil service and of philanthropy, among other things, will give her perspectives. And she'll be followed by Miles, professor of modern history at York, himself a former director of the IHR distinguished historian, especially the Victorian period, notably in his 2018 book, Queen Victor Empress, Queen Victoria and India. And finally, last but not least, we're going to have a Q&A session, which Miles is going to chair. In the first part of that, I believe Miles's intention is to give those contributors to the volume who are in the audience, and quite a number have signed up, to give those contributors, if they wish, to have a chance to put some points first of all, and then to open uh, the Q&A more generally. Throughout these various parts of the session, uh, we're going to try to keep in mind the six main themes of the book as identified in the introduction, and I think admirably followed by the, the contributors. Um, the first of all, the distinctness or otherwise of the decade regarding these and other universities. Second, campus architecture. Third, curriculum design. Fourth, the role of the state. Fifth, the student and staff experience. And last, but again, not least, what happened next after the 1960s, the legacy of the heyday of these uh, utopian universities. So we've got a lot to, to get through in the next um, 90 minutes. Um, so without further ado, I propose to launch into um, my commentary um, as a panelist. And I'm going to do so with particular reference to the four chapters which uh, Miles and Jill kindly assigned to me. Two of them were the chapters on the University of Stirling and the new University of Ulster. And I think one has to admit that these chapters are largely analyses of frustration, at least during the particular period that this volume emphasizes. There were two common factors to this frustration. Both universities were relatively late among these new universities, and both were located on the periphery of the UK. They were operating during a period when enthusiasm for universities began to wane, 
but when key decisions about universities were still being taken in London. Sterling, as analyzed by Holger Nehring, had a wonderful site and seemed to promise extra graduate person power, which Scotland was thought especially to need during this period. Yet Sterling came too late to benefit adequately from the 1960s enthusiasms for universities by the UK government and arguably more generally in the society. Then not having had adequate time to develop, it became one of the particular victims of the most slashing Thatcher cucks, quote unquote, of the early 1980s. In the process, Sterling got no credit either for its innovations in Scottish terms, especially its residential emphasis compared to the commuting emphasis of the older Scottish universities, nor did it get credit for its innovations in British terms, such as semesters, continuous assessment, and its high percentage of non-UK academics in its early years. Ultimately, it lost much from its difficulty in recruiting science undergraduates, and ironically, it lost from the absence of devolution, famously, of course, defeated in the a referendum of the late 1970s. The irony, of course, arose in the fact that Scottish higher education had opposed a proposal that um, higher education be a devolved power in that period. The new University of Ulster, written up for this volume by Thomas Fraser and Leonie Murray, was the victim of a central local dispute about the location of Northern Ireland's new university. After a report from the London-focused Lockwood Committee, the Northern Ireland government unwisely overrode a local cross-sectarian consensus in favor of Derry as the location for the new university and chose Coleraine instead. Then a set of problems worse than those faced by Stirling or any other British utopian universities came along, i.e. the Northern Irish sectarian troubles of the late 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. And in retrospect, the dispute over the location of the new university was a contributing factor, perhaps a minor contributing factor, but a contributing factor to the onset of the troubles after the government ignored a mass protest in Derry, which crossed sectarian lines led by the future political luminary, John Hume. The troubles doomed Coleraine, eventually leading to merger and the current University of Ulster. So both Scotland and Northern Ireland provide gloomy perspectives on the UK's utopian universities of the 60s, not least on the inability of local supporters to back up their new institutions effectively once they'd been established, one of the themes of Jill Pellew's chapter in this volume. I've also been looking, as requested, at two foreign comparators Canada and the USA, where as it happens, I was raised and had my own undergraduate education during the period in question. The Canadian University, Simon Fraser, Trent and York, in the chapter by Paul Axelrod, present cases much more similar than were Sterling or Ulster to the English plate glass universities in this volume. Timing was much more in the Canadian's favor than was the case at Sterling or Ulster though admittedly these three Canadian institutions, like many of their English counterparts, were under attack by the end of the decade. All three of these Canadian universities had significant doses of innovation, especially regarding curriculum buildings and their residential focus. And these three institutions with strong leadership represented a self-conscious differentiation from what their founders viewed as a stagnant Canadian university system. So despite the backlash against them from the 1970s, these innovations through these institutions had enduring impact in the argument of the chapter, both internally and on Canadian universities generally. Finally, the American chapter by Christopher Newfield provides insights into the legendary Berkeley Chancellor and University of California President Clark Kerr, who became a secular saint of the university world after he was sacked by the state's governor, one Ronald Reagan. Newfield shows the conflicts between even such enlightened administrators as Kerr with faculty members, 
as well as with the student radicals and the politicians of the day. In Newfield's view, a quote, limited utopian hope, unquote, of Kerr and his colleagues was undermined by their managerialism. It seems to me that this chapter has some important insights, both into the University of California and into the highly influential three-tiered model of the California higher education system as a whole. Though I would note, as Newfield does, that contrary to the lessons that some British policymakers early this century took from the California system, Clark Kerr's emphasis was on widely distributing research money among institutions rather than on narrowly concentrating it. There are also broader implications for the, of the chapter for American higher education in the 60s. Newfield notes, quote, the easy access for all while reserving costly quality to a small elite, unquote. He also points to a lack of ethnic diversity and an emphasis on sheer growth. But inevitably, this chapter only begins to hint at the rich scope for comparison and contrast with the UK's utopian universities of the huge and rapidly expanding American higher education sector in this period, not least with regard to social composition, a theme highlighted by Peter Mandler in his afterward to the volume that we're launching today. In this respect, as in many others, it seems to me that this volume is opening up research rather than attempting to close it down. So I'll finish my commentary there and hand on to Professor Sir Chris Husbands. Chris. Uh, Rick, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be asked to speak. Rick, you suggested that I draw on my own experiences at UEA and at Warwick, and I'm delighted to do so. Um, history from below has an excellent pedigree. UEA gave me my first university job. Warwick made me a university leader and manager. Where were they different and where were they similar to each other? Did they share a utopian vision? In curriculum, UEA, with the interdisciplinary schools that John Chalmers describes, was as innovative as Sussex and its new map of learning. Warwick was far more conservative. In the 1960s and 1970s, Sussex and UEA looked far more interesting, but it seems with hindsight that conservatism played out more strongly. The coda of John Chalmers' chapter is the dissolution of UEA's interdisciplinary schools. So was the new map of learning wrongly drawn or did the end of the long post-war boom and subsequent retrenchment do for it? At UEA, the RAE provided the final twist of the knife. More generally, was curriculum not after all the most important innovation of the 1960s, however striking it looked? Perhaps far more important was the fact that they were there at all. In origin, Warwick was glued into the fabric of West Midlands manufacturing with the early support of Lord Roots, which better equipped it for a vocational era of value for money and graduate outcomes. It managed its relationship between academia and industry, sometimes clumsily, but with increasing and now exemplary confidence. When I moved from UEA to Warwick, my new colleagues were very keen to impress on me that they thought I'd gone up in the world. An interesting difference between UEA and Warwick is not covered in John Charmley's account, and there's no reason why it should be. I picked it up from Michael Sanderson's official history of UEA. In 1968, UEA and Warwick both asked the UGC for permission to establish schools of engineering. The UGC said no. UEA accepted the decision. Warwick ignored it and went ahead anyway. The Warwick Manufacturing Group was the long-term result. Peter Mandler has an interesting line at the end of the book. It's not about any of the utopian universities, but it's about the University of Lincoln. Lincoln emerged through a series of land deals from what was Humberside Polytechnic, and it spent the last 15 years, as Peter points out, making itself into a traditional civic university. The utopian universities wanted to be innovative, but their power structures 
were traditional and their market was demand led, something Peter has shown elsewhere. Looking back, and I came very late into this movie as a 1990s employee at UEA and at Warwick, they were more similar to each other than each liked to believe. Now, they may be more similar tradi to traditional conceptions of universities than they ever thought they wanted to be. So this is a fascinating book and it gives us an account of an all but lost world. It's a recognizable world and the institutions it describes are all still with us. The key actors are all within living memory, but the ordered and orderly world of planning committees and grants boards of local hierarchies and certainties of elegant handwritten memos has gone. And I strongly recommend a glance at the photographs following page 240 and there's a particularly striking one of a behatted lady looking askance at Dennis Lasden's designs, ziggurat designs for the University of East Anglia. There's a striking summary explanation of the changed world tucked away on page 226 in Jill Pellew's account of philanthropy and support and I'm going to quote two or three sentences from it. She says this, the great expansion of university places was predicated on a huge and continuing Whitehall subvention. At that time, few seriously anticipated potential problems, such as threats to academic freedom or the lack of long-term sustainability that might lie in the creation of new, new universities, far more reliant than ever before on a single paymaster, central government. After all, it was an optimistic post-war socialist society that believed that taxes were the only realistic way of paying for a major educational experiment. That really is a long lost reality. It's a reminder perhaps that whatever those of us in educational institutions might think, ultimately societies get the education systems they deserve and that reflect underlying economic and social realities. The 1960s on this account was indeed a world we have lost and we lost it in the tide of fiscal retrenchment that followed the end of the post-war boom. The staff and students didn't know how lucky they were. Not curriculum, not vision, not philosophy, just the sheer fact of existing. One final point as a footnote. Carolyn Stevens' chapter on the establishment of social history at Warwick confirmed my long held suspicion that E.P. Thompson, great scholar though he was, must have been a nightmare to manage even in the financially easier days of the 1960s. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. I'll now turn to Professor Heiko Jantz. Heiko. There we are. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to this fascinating panel. My comments are from the perspective of a geographer who has published on both uh, global higher education from historical and contemporary perspectives. Based on this positionality, I have enjoyed reading the book Utopian Universities very much, and especially the globally incredibly inclusive introduction in terms of neoliberal audit cultures, I think that Dilts and Miles' book introduction provides a refreshing reminder that universities as communities of learning are existing in large numbers in different parts of the world, in different political regimes, and in different language areas. I was asked to comment on the three book chapters on German reform universities student radicalism in Nanterre and the role of philanthropy for the foundation of the English plate glass universities. Guided by Jilts and Miles question about the legacy of the 1960s universities, I would like to make three points. First, I think that the chapters on Germany and France illustrate the great extent to which university expansion in the 1960s was shaped by the Cold War and by the emulation of American universities at the height of their hegemony. 
Stefan Paulus argues in his chapter that the influential memorandum of the politician Hans Werner Roth in 1961 on the new University of Bremen as an American campus university has profoundly shaped the campus design in the other three reform universities that he focuses upon uh, Bochum in an old industrial uh, city and then in more rural towns, Constance and Bielefeld. This was done with more or less success, ranging from the intimidating modern brutalist campus in Bochum to the more modest designs in Constance and Bielefeld. Intriguingly, Stefan's description of Water's ideal campus centered around a central square with lecture halls, student union, and administrative buildings and situated next to unreserved land for future university expansion reads exactly like a description of Loughborough University campus where I work. So Loughborough has uh, today the largest single site university campus in the UK. It was upgraded from a college of advanced technology to a full university together with nine other cats in 1966 on the recommendation of the Romans report. And I think that this striking resemblance of campuses shows the great extent to which the 1960s were shaped by Americanization across different European countries. My second point stresses that student radicalism in the 1960s universities and elsewhere has made European societies more democratic, more diverse and more inclusive but that its call for racial equality has not been achieved by today. Victor Collett in his book chapter discusses student radicalism on the new campus of the Sorbonne's Faculty of Letters in Nanterre. The modernist buildings of 1962 also followed American models, but paradoxically these modern high-rise buildings offered students and staff, among them left-wing intellectuals like Henri Lefebvre and Jean Bourdieu, views of Red Nanterre's industrial factories. I'm talking about Nanterre and Victor Collet's book chapter, where anti-colonial, anti-war, anti-fascist and anti-racist protests are amalgamated with Maoist, anarchist and other leftist activities that were pro-immigration, pro-workers, pro-women and pro-sexual liberalization with an attempt to change everyday life. So this openness towards pedagogic experimentation and political radicalism in the 1960s universities has clearly paved the way for more diverse political expressions and lifestyles, gender equality and European integration. But I think that the legacy leaves us with the task to achieve greater cultural diversity and racial equality in European higher education. In British universities, black and minority ethnic students currently account for 21% among university staff only 8%. The third point I wish to make shows that the success of the 1960s universities resided on public funding, while philanthropic giving remains underdeveloped in German, French and British universities up until today. In the UK, this is a paradox because Jill Pellew's chapter stresses that the University Grants Committee even made local financial contributions a key criterion for awarding a university in the 1960s because this criterion had been important for the foundation of the red brick universities. Jill points out that in the 1960s, fundraising from local authorities, businesses and private individuals varied enormously and shaped, was shaped by location, the location of the university and the subject structure. 
before it then declined in importance in the 1960s, uh, 70s, so that I think that this approach cannot be a model for the future. We need to remember that from 1960 to 1977, UK universities were funded to over 80% from public sources. And this is just the share as it is in German universities today. Teaching fees amounted back then to 10%. In 2018-19, it reached 49%. Only a quarter of British universities' total income comes from direct government sources and endowments and donations are about 2%. This, of course, varies by university. So since British universities have currently been affected by the triple crisis of strikes for fair pensions, COVID-19 and Brexit, I wish to conclude by issuing the urgent plea that the British government needs to invest extra funds in its universities, because as the book Utopian Universities shows us, the legacy of the Utopian Universities means that a sustainable economy and regional economic growth outside of London requires increased public funding for the universities and not less. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heike. I'd now like to turn to Dr. Joanna Newman. Joanna? Thank you very much. And actually, what a wonderful place to, to come in after, after you, Heike, because actually your point about investment in higher education is exactly what the Association of Commonwealth Universities believes for all its 500 members. And when preparing for this uh, talk, and I so enjoyed reading this book, I found out so much more about our, the universities in our network. And in fact, I read an introduction by the then uh, Vice Chancellor Nigel Harris of the University of the West Indies uh, in a volume which talked about the centenary of the ACU, which was held in 1913. And that book was called Universities for a New World. Um, uh, the ACU in 1913 was called the University's Bureau of the British Empire. And it published a yearbook and it, it interviewed staff for colonial universities set up on the model of the University of London. And I, I really enjoyed reading Miles's chapter on the Utopian Universities of the British Commonwealth, also on the chapters on Australia and on India and Canada, because many of the universities talked about are our founding members. And so seeing the history of how they, they fitted in was absolutely fascinating. Um, the, the point is, I think, though, that as the ACU grew as the as the as the movement to empower uh, young people grew and as the movement to, to grow the access to universities grew. So we now have over 530 universities in a network where 66 percent of our members are in low and middle income countries. Um, but the um, disparity is still incredibly clear. So in 1970, only 10%, there was a global average of 10% accessing uh, universities, tertiary enrollment. And today it's 38%, 77% in North America and in Europe, and only 8% in Sub-Saharan Africa, where, for example, Makerere University, uh, one of the uh, universities uh, featured in our chapter was a central plank in the 1960s. Um, so that really, that really struck me um, that um, we, we, we haven't really, that the idea of a utopian world where universities really matter is, some, is, a, is a fight that we're making at UN level because we believe that there isn't really any uh, progress that can be made without societies having strong universities. And so the association Commonwealth Universities has been working with our members uh, in areas like research strengthening uh, and um, early career researchers over the last over the last decades in in those areas. Um, but that's a battle that that is also what was also struck me when I was reading the chapters was what was so interesting is that in the recent um, Roads Must Fall campaigns and Black Lives Matter the lack of connection to those early anti-colonialist arguments that were made at the time that the universities were created. And reading those chapters reminded me again 
of people who like CLR James talked and wanted to have local languages, local culture, local history reflected in the curriculum of their universities. And it's really interesting to see how in a way in the campaign in Britain for having a curriculum that reflects our colonial history, we would have been able to make more of the links and to be able to see that this is not a new battle to be fought. This is something that has always been there. And the ACU has a peace and reconciliation network that talks about these issues. And it also really struck me that where he's in, Mac uh, in, East, uh, in East Africa, Makareri and for example, university in, in, in Tanzania were talking about indigenous curriculums at the time. Perhaps the York University that grew out of Toronto and the universities in Australia have only recently really been tackling their colonial past and looking at issues around indigenous. So for example, in um, um, Melbourne University, they have a PVC, Sean Ewan, Professor Ewan is the PVC for indigenous and leads our peace and reconciliation network. But it was having a meeting with him where we had universities from across the Commonwealth discussing issues around indigenous that uh, the Nairobi University said it had to be in Australia that we could talk about the value of using indigenous languages in a curriculum. So when I read these chapters, what really fascinated me was how live all of these issues are, but how live they have been right from the beginning and how, for example, a university like JNU right from the beginning had positive discrimination embedded in its uh, institution. And I have to say, I have enjoyed many visits to JNU on behalf of Kings when I worked there uh, and, and subsequently, and its spirit of rebellion and its spirit of, uh, of engagement with these issues is as strong as it ever was and as described it in the chapter, which I really enjoyed reading. Um, I think that if I look today, I, we, we gave a presentation to education ministers of the Commonwealth uh, recently and talked about the huge issues that still affect people. And it's not just, as Heike was saying, it's not really just in the global south, it's in the global north as well, that there is a huge divide uh, and uh, that, that there is still a lack of access for education. So for example, the issues that we think really matter at the moment are around the digital divide. Uh, access to, to being able to, particularly during COVID, but it's really exposed uh, the lack of access to, to uh, data, for example. There is still a teacher training shortage, there is skills and training shortage, and there is gender violence and gender inequality in most countries, uh, including in the UK. And it's these issues that, that, still, uh, that, that still need addressing. And so we are very far away from a utopia, I think, in, in terms of um, a vision for, for universities. Um, but I, I would just like to thank you for in, uh, involving me in this panel because it's been an absolute pleasure to be involved in the, the looking at the origins of so many of the universities in our network and seeing uh, their place um, in, in creating really strong connections today that actually help with the issues I've been talking about through mobility three schemes and through research collaborations and exchanges, which are making a difference, I think, to the people's lives in those countries, in our countries, uh, and also to the state of research and education. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. Uh, well, we four panelists have had our say, and uh, it's time to hand over now to the two co-editors, and I'm First of all, go ahead and hand over to Jill, who in turn will hand over to Miles. Jill, over to you. You're muted, Jill. I want to pick up on one of our themes, um, that our campus universities were the product of careful state planning and look at what that state planning meant in the UK in our decade with a pointer to the other theme of what happened next. Two features stand out very much in the creation of our utopian universities and is apparent uh, in many, with many references. They were created from top down and they quickly became national rather than local institutions. By top down, I mean they were conceived, resourced and implemented with common features from central government via a central government Whitehall-linked body, the University Grants Committee. This process was quite new 
the Red Brick University foundations that William White references in his chapter of the book, going back to the mid 19th century, although, as he argues, had many things in common with the new universities, they had been founded in a very different way from bottom up through local civic initiative and finance and largely to suit local needs and local pride. Those university colleges started by awarding the degrees of the University of London, and it took until 1957, shortly before our period starts, until those 12 universities became autonomous, awarding their own degree. By that time, they all received what had become their major annual subvention from central government via the UGC. In the post-war period, two things gave this body real heft. First, in 1948, it acquired expanded powers and was tasked to ensure that universities were fully adequate to meet national needs. In particular, those national needs included increasing the technical and scientific education of the young in the oncoming Cold War environment, and following the 1944 Butler Education Act, which made provision for universal secondary education to meet the increasing demand of the expanding numbers of able sixth formers, ambitious to further their education at universities. Second, in 1953, the appointment of a new chairman, Keith Murray, who features throughout, and there is a good picture of him in the illustrations, heralded a dynamic period of leadership of this key committee at the center of government. After careful research, Murray and his team became convinced that those national needs could be met in only one way, through the creation of new centrally funded institutions. He and his committee set about designing and implementing something of a blueprint for what by 1963 became our new English universities. It was an incremental process requiring treasury and parliamentary approval for each stage. Four important features of that blueprint are worth a comment and they come through in all the account, in many of the accounts of those universities. First, they were to be autonomous. Keel, as Miles Taylor um, <clears throat> sets out in his chapter on Keel, had set the pace as we see there having been the first new British university to be granted the right to award its own degrees after the war. Secondly, Murray and his team worked out a rough sort of standardization in terms of the requirements for the siting of university campuses, the nature of the city chosen, the size of the greenfield site required, the nature of local support. I think the account of York is very helpful in illustrating that particular feature of Murray's thinking and activities. Thirdly, Murray effectively involved a very powerful network of academic good and great on academic planning boards that were assigned to each university in order first to choose the vice chancellors and secondly, to help work out the design of the curricula. Fourthly, Murray strongly encouraged interaction between local initiative and national policy in the development of these new universe institutions. He knew that this was essential for locating and acquiring a site, for undertaking local public relations exercises, for raising essential initial additional funds until the arrival of the first students when state funding kicked in, and later managing a local appeal for supplementary funds, especially for student residences. Some of that's been pointed to by Heike. Thank you, Heike. I mentioned that our universities almost immediately became national rather than local institutions. Again, a novelty in the history of founding British universities. This was encouraged by two things. The 1960 Anderson Report recommendations, provided for state and county authority funding of students' fees and maintenance, whichever university they chose to attend. Secondly, the creation of student living accommodation became a standard feature of the universities. Thus, for example, 
a sixth form graduate from a school in Liverpool did not have to live at home and go to their local university, but could be funded to become a residential student at, say, Sussex. So a county authority had no particular connection with its own residents attending university in any other part of the country. Other factors began to detach universities somewhat from their host localities. Universities became complex enterprises, partly more inward looking, yet outward looking and international across academia, something that could inhibit and did inhibit town gown links. Towards the end of the period, student activism, which we read about uh, in several of the chapters and unrest offended local communities. Thirdly, local authorities acquired other responsibilities towards non-university higher education institutions. That largely grew out of the way in which the UK government decided to administer these um, higher education institutions after the Robbins report of 1963, set up by the prime minister to review the pattern of full-time higher education. Robbins optimistically endorsed the effect of the major and increasing creation of university and other non-university school, post-school opportunities, portraying these almost as a human right for those who qualified. And Robbins argued for more of the same on the basis of continuing pressure from uni for university access. In terms of those national needs that we referred to earlier, the Robbins report argued that in order to maintain Britain's position in the modern world, there should be continued expansion of university student places, growing from the planned 100, nearly 200,000 in 1967 to eight, to 217,073 to four and on. More new universities were foreseen and the founding of a Scottish university, Stirling, uh, very well told by Holger Nehring, was one outcome. To meet the increased science and technology requirement endorsed by Wilson's Labour government, Robin successfully recommended the transforming of some 15 um, Heike said it, we said it was 10, I may have got this number wrong. Um, anyway, a, a dozen or so colleges of advanced technology, the CATS, one of which of course was Loughborough, um, hitherto managed by local authorities. Robbins wanted those raised to university status and successfully argued for that. It also argued unsuccessfully for the creation of five new high powered technology universities modeled on MIT. Finally, a point I want to make is to address a very thorny issue about how to place teacher training and local technical colleges into the overall system. These colleges currently run by the Department of Education and local authorities, not the UGC and the treasury, should have a closer relationship with the universities and be folded into the UGC umbrella and become part of an overall cohesive system of higher education. For Robbins, along with Murray, who was closely involved in the whole issue of the Robbins report, um, they believed in a coordinated national higher education system based on traditional values that underpinned the British universities. Overarching the whole scheme was Robbins's proposal that the UGC should report to a new broad-based government department of arts and science. Such, such strategic coordination was not to be. Serious departmental objection immediately arose within the then so-called Ministry of Education, formulated by its senior civil servants, partly on ideological grounds, as well as from departmental jealousy. Remember that the universities reported in a sense to Murray in the UGC and the treasury and were not part of that Ministry of Education to, that ran local authority responsibilities. The university so-called autonomous sector was presented by that department as elitist, pucker, many other words of the same ilk. 
the realization social, of social justice and creation of widening opportunities for a poorer section of the community than those who went to universities were best served by the local authorities retaining their relationship with their institutions. Thus argued the Deputy Undersecretary in alliance with some of the trade unions concerned with teachers. This was publicly presented by the then Labour Minister of Education, Tony Crossland, in a famous speech at Woolwich Polytechnic in April 1964. Thus was born the well-known binary policy of higher education, with so-called autonomous universities on the one hand, and rather strangely called public sector institutions or polytechnics on the other. Crossland definitely preferred, as he put it, this situation to the alternative concept of a unitary system hierarchically arranged on the ladder principle with the universities at the top and the other institutions down below. Thus a new department of education and science, less visionary than that proposed by Robbins was created within which the so-called autonomous sector universities was administered by the UGC now detached from the treasury. While the so-called public sector, other non-university colleges and institutions were managed quite separately. This was a far cry from Robbins's and Murray's belief in a strategically coordinated national higher education system based on the fundamentals of university thinking. And this was developing in the last years of our decade as we know, of course, it lasted until the Polytechnics reached the universities on the famous ladder in 1992 and were themselves able to become autonomous by awarding their own degrees. That's the background against which our new universities were founded and early developed. Now I think I hand on to Miles. Thank you very much, Jill. Thank you very much, Rick, and the other panellists for, for helping create so far what's been a wonderfully convivial and stimulating uh, occasion. I won't say very much because I know there are contributors to the panel who would like to uh, say something. And then we do want to, as it were, have a, a roving mic uh, around the rest of the participants where we'll use the chat facility and, and get, some, get some wider discussion going. I really just have two or three points uh, to make. I mean, this this, this book, which is available at a discounted price to all participants in this occasion, this book has been uh, several years in the making. Uh, Jill and I started out back in 2014 when we were conscious that there were a lot of Jubilee celebrations, anniversaries going on around the English universities. And at the Institute, we decided to make, make this a, a subject of a, of a conference. And that's how we began. Um, we, we then bravely, I think, and wisely, following a lot of the discussion at that initial, initial conference in 2014, thought we would throw our lasso further and include not just the English universities, the Northern Irish and the Scottish, but we would look comparatively uh, across, across the world. It was then we realised what a big project we were, we were starting out. I have to say a big project, uh, and some of you may think that it, it's been an expensive project involving us traveling around to wonderfully exotic occasion uh, places uh, like um, Belfast or Fiji or uh, Vancouver. In fact, it's the cheapest research project I've ever been involved in. I think we got away with about £12,000 worth of uh, public and private support, much in the uh, make-do tradition of the original new universities of the 1960s themselves. And out of that, we had a second conference in 2016, and then have been able to bring together all the, all the chapters. So from, from its early uh, start in 2014, we wanted to do something which was a comparative global uh, history. Um, and as we, as we worked on the project and we commissioned further chapters and we internationalized the list of contributors, we realized that this wasn't just a comparative history but it was a connected history that in fact many of the developments that were happening in the UK in the 1960s were connected to developments elsewhere and this was very much a story of, of two-way two traffic things were happening if you like 
in, in the global south or in the global periphery, which were influencing events back in Britain and Western Europe and vice versa. We became conscious very quickly that the story we were telling for the UK and Western Europe and to a certain extent for North America had already happened in many countries in the late 1950s and the 1960s, South Korea, Brazil, Argentina, they had had their moments of university expansion and their moments indeed of student radicalism. And the case studies we were looking at in the, in the West were very much learning from that experience. Another level in which we tracked con connectivity was if you like the fallout from some of the university developments in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, in, in, in Southeast Asia, and how that affected developments back in, in Britain. For example, you know, in, in the mid 1960s in Nigeria and Ghana, and in uh, Rhodesia, English expatriate staff were thrown out of the universities there and came back to find positions back in Britain. We also tracked the way in which a lot of the student radicalism of Western Europe and North America in the 1960s actually starts in 65 in 1966, inspired by and stimulated by events in the global south before the more famous movements that we also document in 1968 and 69. So the subtitle, A Global History, is not just there to register an international comparative approach, but also to show that this was a joined up moment um, in, in the history of higher education at this particular time. The, the second thing that I wanted to say is that we were also trying to write the history of universities rather differently. Um, the history of, of, of universities is a specific field. It has its own journals, it has its own seminars, it has some wonderful networks such as the one that Heike runs at Loughborough. But it also invites a certain kind of navel gazing approach to writing history. And we really wanted to break through that. And, and although, although many of our contributors are in fact products of the universities they describe, we specifically ask them to be as objective and as detached as, uh, as possible. And I think so well did they succeed at that, that I certainly ended the whole project wanting to go to one of these utopian universities. I mean, I happen to be employed by one now, but I really wanted to time travel back to the 1960s and enjoy some of the wonderful new experiences and, and indeed the idealism uh, of, of, that, of that period. Uh, the, the, a couple more points, further, further reflection on the book, and, and this is particularly stimulated by Chris Husband's wonderful contribution. Uh, to coin a, a phrase that's been used in another context, was this the, the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning? In other words, was this the end of that kind of state socialism planning moment that Jill has just summarized? And for example, David Edgerton described so well in his recent work. In other words, a managed economy, a managed state system of higher education put in place by planners who were very much part of that post-war generation. They weren't necessarily thinking of the baby boom, they were thinking of the kind of technocratic society that a modernized Britain needed. Or was it the, 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 the beginning of something else, the beginning of a, a different route for higher education in which there would be more interdisciplinarity, there would be new subjects coming on stream, sociology, social history, business management, history, uh, research into education and, and, and pedagogy, climate change, environment, uh, computing, and so on and so forth, all these parts of the curriculum that were very much pioneered by the new universities. And in the end, I don't think we have an answer to that. Uh, is, 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 is this part of something that is a legacy of the managed state of the 40s, 50s, early 60s, or something that really looks forward to, to the innovation in, in higher education that, that, that follows on. And indeed, were we editing this book now compared to two years ago in, in the midst of uh, COVID-19 crisis and all the impact that has had on the university campuses, I think we might reflect rather more on the extent to which the liberal arts residential campus model of all these universities in the 1960s has fared well or not particularly well over time. But we're here to celebrate not just the book, but to celebrate a very idealistic moment. So I do encourage you to go forward and read the book. Uh, it is available at a discounted uh, code. Have I already mentioned that already? Yes, I think I have. And we're enormously grateful to Bloomsbury 
for sticking with the project and for producing it uh, so beautifully and so uh, efficiently. Uh, very grateful as ever to the IHR for uh, organizing um, th this, th 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 this occasion. And um, we're really looking forward to what the fellow contributors have got to say now, and also the rest of you out there in Zoom land. Thank you all very much. Over back to you, Rick. Yep. Well, I was rather expecting, Miles, you were going to take over at this point. Okay, so that's good. Um, we, we invite contributions via the chat facility. Um, although we are also encouraging our contributors, we've, we've got about half the book's contributors out there. If, if they want to signal that they'd like to say something, then they will be, they can be, un, you can be unmuted and make a contribution. Um, so can I start the ball rolling? Krish, Krishan Kumar, are, are you there? Would you like to, because we we're having a little chat before we started, would you like to offer any, offer any reflections if you're still there? I'm still there. Can you hear me? Yes, very well, loud and clear. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, no, I, I, I just wanted to raise a question that came out of my own experience as, as a long-standing member uh, at the University of Kent, uh, the University of Kent at Canterbury, as it used to be called, it's now simply the University of Kent, which also reflects a fundamental change in its <clears throat> in its orientation. Um, and that actually that the name, the change of name from the University of Kent at Canterbury to the University of Canterbury simply suggests um, the question I really want to raise, which is the relationship. Uh, and I think both both uh, Jill and Heike raised this question about the relationship of these new universities to the locality. Um, I was very struck at Kent at the difficulties we had in making connections with the, the local people, not, I mean, immediately in Canterbury, but more generally in Kent and the region around. Uh, and the, the pull of the national and then increasingly of the international. Um, and I, I think these are two interesting developments. We probably have slightly different forces working uh, with them. Um, in, in the case of Kent, it was probably partly because we were so close to London. And so uh, we didn't really get the patronage, I think, perhaps that we hoped for because uh, many of the people in the locality were funding things in London rather than, than, than in Canterbury. But I wonder also, in, in the English case, the sort of hierarchical model uh, where Oxford and Cambridge, which actually haven't, I don't think anybody's mentioned that uh, so far in our discussions, but um, we were very struck at Kent by the number of people who were from Oxbridge, um, you know, the, I think perhaps I can't remember what the proportion of staff were, but so many of them were recruits. And, and they were sort of looking always back towards Oxbridge. They were sort of thinking of themselves in those terms and the university's development in those terms. Um, and the influence of Oxbridge and the system in England, perhaps in Britain as a whole, does seem to me still so important as the thing that universities aspire to be, to be a proper university despite all the good intentions um, and, and so many of the initiatives to depart from those models, somehow there is a kind of magnetic pull towards things like Oxford and Cambridge. And then increasingly the sense that you had to compete internationally, um, partly for students, which um, certainly, and I, having moved to America, teaching at the University of Virginia here, I'm so conscious of the international factor. We could barely survive without China uh, here, uh, both the graduate and increasingly the undergraduate level. Um, but more perhaps in terms of research reputation, the way in which academics felt increasingly that they had to prove themselves in the international sphere, that too led to a certain kind of internationalization and a different, a different hierarchy, I imagine, uh, in this case, it's not so much Oxbridge as the, the Ivy League universities in the United States that probably provide the model. It's the Harvard, the Princeton, the Yales, the Columbia's and, and those kind of things. But I, I'm, I'm fascinated. I'd like to know more about 
I imagine with the new universities, there were different experiences here about how closely they related to the locality. Clearly Warwick was very clever in getting itself established, in, in, at least in, in relation to the business community. Uh, and it, it flourished as a result. And we had very little success with that in Canterbury. So I just wonder whether others have anything to say about this whole question about the relation between the new universities and the localities in which they were situated. Thank you, Krishan. I'm going to I'm going to take questions and pull pull them if that's all all right with you and points, and then we can uh, then we can all come back to them. So we've got we've got a few people in the chat room now. Um, Chris Chris Newfield, welcome, Chris. Chris wrote a splendid chapter on Clark Kerr based on his interview with with Kerr towards the end of his long long life. Chris, few reflections from you. Um, yeah, I thought I'd say a couple of things about what I think is um, positive about Kerr's legacy. I mean, the, there are some negative aspects, and I, I really emphasize um, one of those in the chapter, and that is that he was very wedded to a kind of a, a managerial approach to operating the complex modern university, and he did not foresee that that would decline into audit culture and a kind of a neo-Taylorist approach to research and teaching, which would end up kind of weakening the faculty's ability to formulate its own vision of the university. I, um, that was down the road. And he also um, didn't deal really well with uh, diversity on the ground. UC was 85% white when he was uh, the first the Berkeley chancellor and then the president. Uh, and it, <laughs> he struggled with political diversity, as is quite well known, especially around the, the free speech movement. But there are some other things that was, I've stayed with me. You know, I met him uh, when he was 86 years old, and I, I spent um, part of that afternoon with him at his kind of amazing house, which is partially recounted in the chapter. And I was all about 50 years younger than, than he was, and I, but I felt like he was passing on um, something of the the, the glory of the, the model of, of thought that the university represents as a, as a social institution. So a few things, he's extremely ambitious for knowledge as the thing that produces the forward progress of humankind and that it had to be integrated knowledge. So he starts Santa Cruz, so it can be a liberal arts college within a research university, had to overcome the two cultures had to get arts, humanities, and social sciences into the address of social problems in an integrated approach. And if it didn't do that, it wasn't really a university. Second thing, um, university leaders would tell policymakers how to do university policy and not the other way around. So he, he helped write the master plan for higher education and he helped structure the process of implementing it and passing it as somebody that had a labor negotiator background so that it would not be business and, and political interests that would decide what the production and transmission of knowledge would look like. And he was pretty militant in his mild mannered way about that. Um, next thing, there was this kind of dream of, of mass quality as, as I think of it. There's a, there'd be full access to the highest possible quality that any given student would be able to take in. And he had the right business model for this, which we have foolishly set aside. And that is um, public funding. You, market allocation will not send high quality to folks that, you know, in a market sense can't pay for it or that don't seem ready to make full advantage of it on the basis of some kind of a quantitative assessment. And so he was quite aware you just had to flood the system with money and great things would happen. And then the last thing I would say is that uh, he was interested in the university as not just the place that would produce a knowledge economy, because this is a new idea in the 50s and 60s that he took from Fitz Machluck and other economists who were developing it, but it's the place where you would constantly assess and reassess the model that you needed, the university's relation for the model for the university relation. So, he brought out in, in the information society. My sense is that we're still kind of stuck in that. It was revised a little bit into the global knowledge economy in the 1990s, but that his legacy and the legacy of the University of California in that expansive moment, and I think the legacy of the universities that 
the book talks about in Britain and, and all over the world in that moment of opening is that the university is the place where we critique the model that we're stuck in and then invent the next model, that it's a act of constructive, a site of constructiveness and transformation and not only a site of critique. Um, and I think that's actually the thing that we can do better if we think of the 60s as the, as the renewal moment or the, re, the rethinking moment of the knowledge economy and not just the, the sticking with that. So um, I'm really very happy to have been part of this great project. And um, thank you, Miles, for, and Jill for keeping us on track with it. Great. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for ending in such a positive point. I think one of the themes of the book is, is that the 60s universities are very much laboratories of, of the kind that, uh, that you're talking about. We've, um, we've got some uh, quite a lot of activity in the, in the chat. Um, Oxbridge has been mentioned back in 2014, uh, Professor Mark Goldie from Churchill College, Cambridge, which of course was Cambridge's contribution to the universities, gave a wonderfully stimulating talk uh, about Churchill College. And I'm very pleased to say that Mark is with us this evening. Mark, come, come on into our discussion, please. Um, yep, we... here I am. Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Just before I say a word about Churchill, let me just uh, take up Christian's uh, very interesting point. Uh, I was at Sussex in the 1970s, uh, the early 70s, when the 60s were still going on until about 73, when uh, I think it's, uh, the 60s came to an end in 73. Um, but I think the point about um, Oxbridge and its influence cut two ways. We were very struck by the number of people who'd fled from Oxbridge. They positively wanted to get out from there and didn't want to reproduce Oxbridge. They wanted to create new curricula. And I think it was on the curricula side that they were particularly innovative and felt, felt that Oxford and Cambridge were strangulated uh, in that regard. But I totally take the point about the teaching modes. I think it's there that they very much reflected uh, Oxbridge and it's not for nothing was Sussex called Balliol by the Sea. The emphasis on the tutorial um, and on residence uh, as well um, was, very much indeed modelled on on uh, um, on Oxbridge. Turning to my own institution now, uh, Churchill, just to make a couple of quick quick remarks. Um, if one were going to include um, Oxbridge institutions in this book, then it would be Churchill, founded in 1960, but conceived in the 50s. Um, and it would be St. Cats in Oxford, which is the obvious um, counterpart and parallel uh, in, in Oxford. And many of the themes that we've been listening about in the last uh, few minutes flow through the creation of Churchill College. What I think particularly interesting about Churchill is that because it was launched and announced in 1958 as the National Memorial to Winston Churchill, whose reputation then was vast, but no, the institution didn't actually begin till 1960, it gave two years of a blank slate in which the commentariat could uh, write upon a blank slate. And so you do get a very uh, powerful and interesting sense of the anxieties and hopes of Britain at mid-century flowing through public discussion at a college that hadn't actually come into being. And I'll just lastly mention two themes that um, I'm sure are in the book, which I look forward to reading, uh, which haven't come up yet. Um, one is the great two cultures debate that uh, C.P. Snow, uh, of course, um, underscored in his famous lecture of 1959. And one of the effects of the two cultures was different schemes for bringing the two together. Lots of the new universities tried schemes for the history and philosophy of science. And there was a lot of talk at Essex and elsewhere about the social sciences being the third culture, the, the, the middle ground, if you like, between those two cultures. The other theme that is very powerful in the creation of Churchill is the Cold War. And I think it's been briefly been mentioned, but a lot of the talk of, about science and technology of the 50s was skewed by this extraordinary mixture of fear and admiration for Soviet science and Soviet progress. And the putting up of Sputnik in 1957, I think was, was very powerful in the fears that, that it created and the responses it created in um, higher education funding and policy in the West. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mark. We, we've got quite a bit in the book about that Sputnik moment. And there's more than can be feasible at universities in the, on the British side claiming to be the next MIT. Uh, um, it seems to apply to a lot of them. Um, Essex, we seem to have a lot of Essex alumni out there. 
uh, coming through on the chat. So I'm going to turn to Carrie Herfele, who who's written a brilliant chapter on the University of Essex in in the volume. Um, Carrie, are you there? I am here. Uh, I'm really enjoying all of the the messages in the chat about Essex, and we have a number of people on the call that have some association with the history of Essex. It, it just struck me as I was listening today how far we've come in the history of these universities really and how remarkable this book is. When I started researching Essex in the 1990s, I spoke to the librarian there and, and it, 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 he was struck by how little had been written about the history of Essex and was so excited that one researcher was actually looking at their university archives. Um, they had been really overlooked up until that point. And so I think it's, a, it's really wonderful to see that these new universities are coming into their own with their own real histories that um, take them seriously and see them as an important development in the world uh, in that time period. So. I'm, I'm very excited about this book coming out and, and, and happy to see so many folks from Essex on the call. As I was reflecting on the, maybe the wider meaning of the experience of the new universities in the 60s, I was thinking about how universities are situated in basically two, facing in two different ways, at least two different faces. One facing towards the economy of, uh, of our, our nations as well as the, the global economy and trying to supply that economy with trained workers, um, trying to respond to the needs of economies. And, and then the other often existing intention with that is the student facing function of universities to help students develop personally and professionally and help them to get what they need out of a university education. And, and sometimes those things are two very different things, what the economy needs and what students need. And I think in, in the 60s, Essex especially, but at most of these new universities, they were caught in that tension where students wanted them to look at universities to look at the students and really address what they needed and all the students wanted them to be. But the universities were often created by governments to serve the economy and to serve the government. And, and so they um, we're, we are all, always situated at that, that tension. And I guess now that I've moved into administration, I'm, I'm much more aware of that tension that we're trying to bridge the gap between those two um, constitu constituencies. Um, so I'll, I'll just keep it brief. I, I, I want other fo folks to have a chance to speak as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie. And, and we hope you've taken the radicalism with you into university management. Um, so so uh, John, John Charmley um, has, has written the wonderful chapter on University of East Anglia, and I suspect might have something to say about the legacy of the new universities. John, are you there? I'm very, I'm here, I'm very much interested in what's, what I've been hearing, because there are commonalities and there are differences, and I think uh, well, I want to say a little bit about both bits. So the locality, well, uh, the University of East Anglia was unique amongst the new universities in that you couldn't find it on a map unless you were a historian of uh, Anglo-Saxon England which was actually a, a long-standing problem. Indeed, when I was there, I once chaired a committee to see if we could change the name to something that everyone could know. Hence, it ended up with UEA Norwich, because by the 1980s, UEA was known for some things. Norwich was at least somewhere you could find on a map. So in that sense, uh, from the word go, the region influenced it in a strange way. Um, it didn't want to be identified with Norwich or with Norfolk, hence, the, hence the, the, the wider geographical name. It was heavily influenced by Cambridge in two strange and contradictory ways. Um, the first way is that its founder, the founding vice chancellor, and here uh, um, tribute to Jill's father, uh, um, Frank Thistlethwaite, uh, 
you can't actually overestimate Frank's influence on the creation of the ethos at UA. He was a Cambridge man through and through at one level. He even insisted that, uh, um, even managed to get £10,000 out of the local council and the UGC to found a wine cellar, for heaven's sake, for UEA. That's quite an achievement. In fact, I've got still got some of the nicer bottles from its uh, dissolution somewhere in my own wine cellar. Um, but at the same time, it's what Chris was saying. It was a total reaction. I think Mark Goldie was making the same point, a total reaction to the Oxford and Cambridge system of knowledge. Frank was a great believer in interdisciplinarity. And in one sense, despite the pressure on universities to be something that the state needed, I think Frank's, Frank was much closer to Newman's idea of a university than almost anybody I can think of. Knowledge for its own sake mattered. And what mattered was not compartmentalizing knowledge, hence the interdisciplinarity. And in that sense, as I think Chris said earlier, the death knell for UEA in a weird way, and I was there to see it happen, was the REF. The REF simply, or the RAE as it then was, it simply did not recognize uh, that, that in many areas that interdisciplinarity was a thing where it had really worked in some areas like environmental science or development studies, that was fine. But one of the problems with taking the bet that Frank and company took was that take my own areas. One of the reasons I went to UEA was uh, I could never decide between English and history and I could do both of them in English and American studies at UEA. So that was wonderful. But the, the disciplines went off in different ways. And so the kind, of, the kind of developments that Frank may have thought would have happened didn't happen. The, RE, the RAE then really, I think, forced the university. I mean, the only way we, we managed to get a school of history and it was the first of the uh, it was the first break in the dam at UEA was frankly we were able to show that separated out into five separate interdisciplinary schools history was a problem for the university indeed just before the RAE the then vice chancellor had been thinking of getting rid of historians we did so well in the uh, 87 RAE that um, it then became possible to say well if you stick us all into one school we might actually make some money for you and we did so what that left UEA with was really, there was a period, and I try to deal with it in the coda to the book, when, if you like, um, Frank's legacy and the modern world um, coincided in a bad way. And I think it really did create a problem. And it wasn't really until David Eastwood came along as VC and actually had the, uh, well, I don't know what, the chutzpah to take on the structures that Frank built that, that UEA changed. I'm not sure whether it was for the better or the worst. That's for others to decide. I, I had left by, well, by the time I was writing the chapter, I'd left, so I was able to be a bit more detached. But I would like to pay a tribute to, to Jill's father and to Jill herself for help with the chapter. But I do think that um, the, the role of those founding vice chancellors, and you know, Frank, just to, to conclude, was almost the image of, C.P. Snow has been mentioned before as two cultures, but actually the C.P. Snow I see is the novelist C.P. Snow, the Mandarin, the man from Whitehall knowing best, and uh, Frank's unparalleled knowledge of Whitehall and how to operate that uh, um, UGC system uh, served UEA very well indeed, and uh, in many senses the fact that UEA uh, overcame the challenges to it was a tribute to the very, very deep foundations laid by Frank Thistlethwaite, who I, I hope I pay a decent tribute to in the book. So that's, that's my contribution, Miles. Thank, thank you very much, John. Very, very, very good to see you. Um, we, we want to turn to Mary McClintock, who's written a wonderful chapter about Lancaster, because Lancaster is, is so different in so many ways, and in particularly in its local relations. Marion, are you there? Let me have a, have a look. I well, she is there, but she's muted. Oh, okay. I'm, 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 can you hear me now? Yes, we can yeah. do you. Thank you. Good. Welcome. Yes, sorry about that. Um, yes, Lancaster uh, was very strongly founded for top-down 
local reasons. It was the last of the seventh to be announced, and it was put there on the map because there was a gap between Liverpool and Glasgow. It was as crude and simple as that. So we were there to help the local economy, which had been drained of its talent since the time of Henry VIII. <laughs> However, there is a tension in the new universities, not just Lancaster, but all of the, these new universities, that they were expected from the outset to undertake research and to do so seriously and to become uh, research as they have uh, several of them become research intensive institutions that now feature in the top 1% of universities globally, which is a remarkable achievement in half a century. But if you have a university whose staff are trying to set up a curriculum, which I described, but also trying to set up their own research and make global connections, then that pushes against the concept of locality. And you have, in our experience, constantly to rediscover the locality. It's being done now through a special provost on sort of engagement. But I think that, I mean, one of the themes that might have been in the book, although I can understand why it was too broad, might have been the research and how the new universities took on that role counterintuitively from the outset and made a success of it, but also the cost that it made for the universities. And I think that there are some issues there which we can't develop now, but deserve unpacking. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Marion. We, um, the chat activity has slowed down a bit. Does any of the panel want to come back? Jill, do you want to come back in? You're muted, Jill. So sorry. I wanted to pick up a message on the chat box by from David Amigoni, which picks up something that Krishan said earlier about town and gown relating to local people, as it were. And um, um, David Anigoni says, Keel had what a, a, appeared to me a pretty close relationship with a locality. And he mentions um, a local cultural um, operation, the local experimental theater. I mean, this was something that early vice chancellors really quite worked on actually. I mean, Asa Briggs was terribly proud and hoped that the Gardner Center was going to do something to help town and gown relations at Sussex. Uh, at Warwick, I think the, the uh, Warwick Arts Center really did in a big way connect, connect the locality with the university and still indeed does. Uh, and at UEA, of course, there's the Sainsbury Center. So I just wanted to make the point that there were those cultural links that maybe were a bit artificial in their conception, but I think um, they, they did help in a, big, in, a, in a bit of a way with that. Great, thank you. Any, anyone, any of the panelists want to come back after everything we've heard? I've got a question from, a comment from David Polfreman about Warwick. We've said a little bit about Warwick, but not much more. Um, it's an excellent chapter and, and Butt Butterworth gets, gets coverage. He's also covered in some of the other chapters as well. Um, warm, warm welcome to, to Shalini Sharma, who co-wrote the chapter on uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in, in New Delhi in India. Would you like to contribute? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Um, I, I was um, I was interested in um, you know um, in the discussion about differences and similarities between these uh, all of these universities. Um, thank you, thank you so much for um, for, for for the for the discussion. Uh, and what what I wanted to say about you know town and gown and um, uh, you know the the relationships between these universities and their localities was uh, that that actually JNU was. You know, it was 
very much a national university and it was built um, part created partly to to override um, any sort of parochialism of of the region um, you know regionalism was seen as as, as something that was dangerous um, in the Indian polity at the time and and something like you know national universities were needed to integrate um, you know the the country as it were so um, so so there are you know while there are similarities and you know that there are utopian um, visions um, there are there are some very striking differences as well um, I also wanted to um, to come back to what some of um, I think one of the panelists uh, was talking about earlier uh, about student activism um, and and hopefully um, some some of the the chapters in the book and um, certainly the ones that, the one that um, I and Rajat Datta wrote about JNU um, it was sort of partly written to um, to to introduce a different way of remembering um, the history of of student uh, activism you know it, it it's not it's not certainly the JNU experience suggests that um, that it was actually student activism that perpetuated the vision that was written into JNU's charter. Um, and, and, and actually, you know, if we, if we look at the, the politics of India today um, and what's happening in um, universities like JNU, especially JNU, um, this, this is still uh, continuing and, and JNU is being attacked by the present Indian government. Um, and also, um, while perhaps, you know, um, Black Lives Matter and the recent um, moves to decolonize the curriculum in universities. Perhaps you know it was suggested that the you know, students within those movements in the West might might not be aware of the histories of student activism and utopian movements in the the you know the universities in in of, you know their their part their own universities and and the histories of their own universities. Uh, I think in JNU, part of um, being a student there in JNU is about knowing and interpreting and reinterpreting JNU's history, which is perhaps, perhaps you know, it, it, I think it's partly that awareness of of JNU's past that that drives um, JNU student activism, um, um, and uh, you know, and, and and the reason why it continues. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for a wonderful, wonderful chapter. Um, I've been reminded that people may not know the discount code, which I've already mentioned several times. Uh, it should be on your invitation, but in case it isn't, the discount code for the Bloomsbury publication is capital U, capital T, capital O, P, UTOP 2020. So uh, do, do take advantage of that. and. Uh, get yourself a copy and the illustrations are, uh, are almost a, a separate essay in themselves, so enjoy those as well. Um, I see the Essex con contingent are still with us and still entering chat. Uh, Rick, I don't know if you want to begin to wind us down. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to do that. But my principal role now is, is to give some thanks, uh, first of all, to the uh, Institute of Historical Research. I think uh, we've had three different uh, directors, yourself, David Bates and Lawrence Goldman, who've been on the line. So we've been a star-studded IHR cast, as well as the uh, help that uh, we had from uh, Gemma and also from uh, Philip Carter, who alas, for family reasons, couldn't be with us today. So um, I think the Institute needs to come first in our thanks. Um, I think we also want to thank Bloomsbury as the publisher and Emily Drew in particular for promoting the volume and coming along today. Um, thirdly, all the contributors, as I said, in my contribution to the panel, I think it's a remarkably rich and well-disciplined uh, collection. And all credit to the contributors. I'll come on to the editors in a moment. Um, fourthly, to my fellow panelists, um, who certainly uh, rose to the occasion. I'm very grateful to them. Um, also for this um, uh, sort of sparkling audience, which has been a very large and full of lots of people who 
have written about universities past and present and played other eminent roles in higher education. Thank you very much for that. But uh, I come back in the end to our thanks to the two co-editors for, the, um, for their entrepreneurship in, in getting this whole idea going, their own contributions to the volume, their editing skills, um, and their roles uh, today. And as I said in my contribution to the panel, I'm struck with the fact that, and the discussion has reinforced this impression, that this volume is really opening up a subject rather than shutting it down. Um, and I think that I mean, the 1960s are clearly the pivot of this particular volume, but the discussion I think raises the possibility of further comparative work of an international kind on the recent history of universities, where recent perhaps is 50, 60, 70 years, maybe since the Second World War, I'm not sure, but um, lots of scope for relating more recent trends to what this volume has brilliantly highlighted about the 1960s themselves. So above all, Jill and Miles, congratulations and, and thanks to you on behalf of everyone who's been involved in this session.